Okay, uh, welcome everybody. So we're happy to have uh, Matt Rupert, who will tell us about constructing braided tensor categories related to the singlet and simple ver affine vertex algebras of SL3. Okay, um, thank you for the invitation to speak. So um, yeah, I'll be talking about constructing braided tensor categories associated to these vertex algebras. And what I really mean by this is I'm going to be identifying and uh, studying a bit quantum groups whose representation categories are expected to be equivalent to these vertex operator algebras or equivalent to categories of modules for these vertex operator algebras and known to be equivalent in the SL2 case, um, at least for uh, the triplet vertex algebra. And so vertex operator algebras really come from uh, conformal field theory. So I'll just start here with some background before I get uh, towards any results. And so uh, conformal field theory, this is just a quantum field theory with extra symmetry. And conformal field theories, they've played a significant role in many areas of physics, including but not limited to string theory, condensed matter physics, statistical mechanics, and so on. And a vertex operator algebra, well, these guys, they were first introduced by Richard Borchards. And what they do is they give us a rigorous formulation of the symmetry algebras for two-dimensional conformal field theory. And uh, like conformal field theory, VOAs have found uh, very far-reaching applications to other areas of mathematics, such as uh, Lie theory, geometry, topology, modular forms, and many others. So what is a vertex algebra exactly? Well, a vertex algebra is a vector space equipped with a distinguished vector, which we call the vacuum vector, a linear operator called the translation operator, and most importantly, a linear map called the state field correspondence, which sends a vector in V to a formal power series with coefficients in NV. And so you can think about a vertex operator algebra as being a kind of natural generalization of uh, ordinary algebras in the following sense. So an algebra is a vector space equipped with a product and a unit satisfying some axioms. You could instead think of the product as being a map from uh, your vector space into endomorphisms on the vector space, sending that vector to the left multiplication operation. And so in this sense, a vertex algebra can be kind of thought of as an algebra with infinitely many products subject to infinitely many constraints. Here, I'm not including any of the constraints that these, um, these uh, operators maps and the, uh, the vacuum vector are subject to. Okay. And so for a long time, the study of VOAs was focused on uh, rational VOAs. And so these are VOAs which have representation theory, which is both finite and semi-simple. And those VOAs which have non-semi-simple representation theory are broadly referred to as logarithmic. And so the work on logarithmic VOAs, this has been mostly focused around specific examples, such as the triplet, the singlet, uh, the BP algebras, um, and many more now. And so for us, we'll consider uh, two main examples. And so these will be the triplet and the singlet algebras. So the triplet, um, you can associate to each finite dimensional, simple, complex, simply laced Lie algebra, a logarithmic vertex algebra, which we denote by WG of R, where R is a uh, positive integer greater than or equal to two, called the triplet vertex algebras. The triplet vertex algebras are certainly the most well understood example of a logarithmic vertex algebra. We expect that in general, um, sorry, the SL2 case is the most well understood example. We expect that in general, the representation categories should be log modular. Log modular here just means modular where we don't impose the semi-simplicity condition. So these are like uh, Riemann categories uh, with some sort of non-degeneracy. 
and not necessarily semi-simple. And this is actually known to be true in the SL2 case. Uh, the singlet algebras, well, these are realized as families of sub-VOAs of the triplet. So the triplets, they admit this distinguished family known as the singlet vertex algebras. And the SL2 singlet is probably the most well understood logarithmic vertex algebra, which does not have finite representation here. Okay, but there are um, a few others that are you know, somewhat understood now, such as the BP vertex algebra. Okay. And so I mentioned at the beginning, um, what I really want to do is I want to identify quantum groups which um, have representation theory, which are in some cases known to be equivalent to the representation theory for these vertex algebras. And then in, you know, the cases I'm considering uh, expected to maintain these equivalences. And so I'll introduce these quantum groups now. So the restricted quantum group of uh, SL2 at 2rth root of unity Q, this is just the C algebra with four generators, E, F, K, and K inverse with these uh, relations here. And so this is just the uh, usual um, Katz DiCancini quantum group at root of unity, where we impose this, uh, we have this quotient where we take e to the r and f to the r to be zero. And there's also kind of a standard structure that we usually take for a Hopf algebra on this quantum group. Uh, and the small quantum group is then obtained by imposing this relation k to the 2p equals one. So the small quantum group that people are probably familiar with actually imposes um, just k to the p equals one when uh, you're at a two p, uh, sorry, I've mixed my notation. P should be r here. Um, but here we'll call the small quantum group, um, the one where we impose this relation k to the two r equals one, okay? And so when we're talking about representation theory, what you should think about here is that the abelian structure of the representation theory is somehow fixed by the algebra structure of the quantum group. And then the finer structure like monoidal structure is being determined by the, uh, the co-product and like rigidity is being determined by uh, the Hopf algebra structure. Okay, so there's one other family of quantum groups to uh, introduce here. And so these are called the unrolled restricted quantum groups associated to a simple complex Lie algebra. And so these are obtained by taking the smash product of the restricted quantum group with the universal enveloping algebra of the Carton subalgebra of G. And so in the SL2 case, what this amounts to is just taking the restricted quantum group adding a fifth generator H with these you know, relations here. And then again, you can extend the uh, unrolled restricted quantum group to a Hopf algebra in a pretty natural way. And so throughout, we'll always be considering when talking about um, unrolled quantum groups, the category of finite dimensional weight modules. And so these are the modules which decompose as a direct sum of the eigenspaces of H and for which um, K and Q to the H coincide as operators on that module. Okay. So the Kazdan Lustig correspondence comes from, of course, the work of Kazdan and Lustig in the early 1990s. And so what they originally did was they proved a braided equivalence between representation categories of affine Lie algebras at generic levels and quantum groups at a corresponding parameter Q. And so these uh, categories of modules for the affine Lie algebras were later realized as vertex tensor categories of modules for the corresponding affine vertex operator algebra. So this was kind of lifted to an equivalence of quantum groups and vertex operator algebras. And now we generally refer to these kind of equivalences between module categories for quantum groups and module categories for vertex algebras as the Kazdan-Lustig correspondence. And when the VOAs in question are logarithmic, 
then it's the logarithmic Kazdem-Lichter correspondence. And the logarithmic Kazdem-Lichter correspondence was first investigated um, in 2006 to 2007 in a series of papers by Fagan, Ganitinov, Serkatov, and Tipunin. And in their papers, uh, they conjectured an equivalence between the small quantum group of SL2 and the triplet. And so this is occurring uh, at uh, the triplet at parameter R and the quantum group at 2R through the union. And so this would. So yeah. in, the, in the Kazan Lustig uh, correspondence, um, the, the quantum group is this, this, this is the small quantum group, or is this a restricted? What, what quantum group uh, is on the side of the equivalence? So, so this is the small quantum group. Uh -huh. And then the unrolled, the reason I introduced the restricted one is because when we talk about the unrolled quantum groups, we don't want to impose this condition on K. Okay. So, so for the, sorry, go yeah. ahead. So for the triplet algebra, we have the small quantum group, and then we'll see for the singlet, now we have the unrolled restricted quantum group where uh, this equivalence is expected to take place. I see. And these last two theorems are, um, the, the, so the Kazan Lustig, the original Kazan Lustig correspondence is between um, a category of modules for affine Lie algebras. And then these last two theorems are on the level of vertex algebras. Yeah. And so, well, the original one, these categories were later realized to also be equivalent to categories for vertex algebras. Okay. So this was kind of, originally it was for affine Lie algebras, but then it got kind of lifted to an equivalence for vertex algebras as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, and so this uh, conjecture for the singlet, the SL2 singlet, this first appeared uh, in the work of uh, Costantino, Gear, and Petiro in 2014. And later in the work of uh, Kreutzig, Millis, and myself, we provided some motivation for this conjecture. So in particular, we uh, found an identification of simple modules in these categories, which preserves like conjectural ribbon equivalences and uh, fusion structure. So these things are kind of hard to work with because the singlet algebras are difficult and at the time they were not well understood, um, but they're uh, better understood now. So, um, so this conjecture by uh, Fagan et al, was uh, the subject of a fair bit of research. And so in 2009, it was proven by Nagatomo and Suchia that there does in fact exist an abelian equivalence between these categories, where Q is taken to be uh, e to the pi i over r. However, um, Kondo and Saito did a deep dive in classifying um, indecomposable modules in the category of the small quantum group and studying their tensor products. And they found very directly that uh, this category is actually not braided. So the original conjecture of uh, Fagan et al, as it was stated, couldn't be true, but we have a very natural question, which is, can we modify the structure of the small quantum group, right? Modify the like quasi hop structure in such a way that the representation theory is braided and that this category of modules does in fact realize an equivalence with the category of modules for the triplet, okay? So does there exist a quasi hopf algebra whose algebra structure coincides with the small quantum group which realizes this equivalence, okay? And so uh, this then became the subject of uh, a number of research papers. And it turns out that this is true. And the way that you uh, find this structure is by thinking about, first of all, unrolled quantum groups, and also the uh, relationship between vertex algebra extensions and commutative algebra objects. So I'll uh, briefly describe that here. So a commutative algebra object in a tensor category C with braiding C and left unit isomorphism L. Well, this is just an object in the category equipped with C morphisms, one from A tensor A to A. So this is the product and one from the unit uh, object into A. So this is like the unit morphism uh, satisfying associativity, commutativity and the unit uh, axioms. And so what you should really think about here is that a commutative algebra object is just an algebra which 
um, lies in the category as an object and for which the uh, product and unit morphisms are morphisms in the category. And so we associate um, to any commutative algebra object, another category, rep A. And so this is the category consisting of pairs of objects. The first V is an object in C. And the second mu V is a morphism from A tensor B to V. And so then you just assume that it satisfies associativity in uh, the unit axiom. So these are just the axioms that you would need to make this uh, a molecule. I think about this as a molecule. And we actually want to consider a certain subcategory of rep A. And so this is called the category of local modules. And so these are going to be the uh, objects in rep A whose kind of action, mu V, doesn't see the double braiding. So if you compose mu V with the double braiding, you just get back mu V. And so the reason we care about this, we have two reasons. First of all, this category is braided. So although we started with a braided category, rep A is in general, uh, it doesn't need to be braided, but the category of local modules is. And we'll see soon that the category of local modules plays an important role for the extension theory of vertex algebras. Okay, and so uh, this category always comes equipped with um, an induction functor. So this is a functor from C into rep A that just sends an object V to A tensor V. And the action is then given by the product on A tensored with the identity. So we have a very natural way of constructing uh, large families of modules in rep A. And this induction functor, it always sends something into rep A and um, some of those modules will get sent into the category of local modules. Some will not, in general, we need to check. OK, so uh, what is the role played by these guys for vertex algebras? Well, given a vertex operator algebra V and rep V, some vertex tensor category of modules for V, a vertex operator algebra extension, so this is just some vertex algebra containing V as a sub VOA, uh, in rep V, so in rep V, I mean, um, we can view this extension as a module over V, and we're assuming that as a module over V, it lies in this vertex tensor category rep V. So this is equivalent to a commutative algebra object in rep V with trivial twist and injective unit. So um, vertex algebra extensions, which live in a vertex tensor category of modules for V, this is equivalent to commutative algebra objects in this category. And so the category, uh, and the second statement here is that the category of modules for this extension, which lies in this category, this is equivalent to the category of local modules of the extension where we're now viewing it as a commutative algebra object. So we can use these kind of categorical ideas to say a lot about the representation theory of uh, vertex algebra extensions. And so what we really want to think about here is the case where um, the vertex algebra we start with is the singlet, the extended vertex algebra, or the extension is the triplet, and we're considering here this uh, category rep S. And so this is the, um, this should be smallest subcategory of singlet modules generated by irreducibles with respect to tensor products, direct sums, and quotients. Okay, and so in this sense, we can view the triplet as a commutative algebra object over the singlet, and we can exploit this conjecture with the equivalence of the singlet modules with the unrolled quantum group to identify some sort of algebra object um, in the category of modules for the unrolled quantum group and then kind of pin down what the quasi-hop structure on the small quantum group should be. So how does this go? Well, we can prove the kazdam lushta correspondence now as follows. First, you want to determine the structure of the triplet as a module over the singlet and show it's a direct sum of simple modules. In fact, it's a direct sum of simple currents. 
simple currents are invertible objects, meaning there's another object in the category such that their tensor product is the unit object. You then want to identify a algebra object in the category of modules for the unrolled restricted quantum group, which corresponds to the triplet um, viewed as an object, uh, viewed as a module over the singlet. And so the way we do this, as I mentioned before, that we have some identification of simple modules between these categories. And so if you understand what the triplet looks like as a direct sum of simple modules for the singlet, you can identify the corresponding object, the corresponding module for the unrolled quantum group. And you can prove that this is a commutative algebra object. And then you want to look in detail at the structure of its category of local modules. Matt, will, will you say what this object AR is explicitly or? Uh, no, not here, but it's a, uh, in the, for the unrolled quantum group, it'll be a direct sum of one dimensional modules. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so for the quantum group, um, the invertible objects have to be one dimensional, but for the vertex algebras, they don't. Okay. Thanks. And so what you then want to do is you want to identify a quasi hopf algebra uh, whose representation theory coincides with this category of local modules, right? So the idea here is based on the previous theorem, the category of modules for the triplet has to be equivalent to this category of local modules if the conjecture of equivalence between the singlet and the unknown quantum group is true, okay? And then of course you have to do the hardest part, which is actually proving that the structure you get on this quasi hopf algebra does realize this equivalence. And so the first three steps here, these were taken in a paper by Kreutzig, Gainutinov, and Runkel. And then the final step of actually proving this equivalence. So this was proven in a paper by Kreutzig, Muntner, and myself for R equals two. And essentially what we did there is we took kind of the most accessible structure on the triplet, and we classified all the quasi hopf algebras which could possibly give an equivalence. And we found that in fact, there's only one. And this was the one conjectured previously by Kreutzig and Nathanov. And so this equivalence was then proven for arbitrary R by uh, Chris Negrin and Terry Gannon. So we now know that the kazdan lishley correspondence for the uh, triplet algebras is true. So this does hold for arbitrary R. And so this leads us to a number of potential future research directions, uh, natural research directions. So the first is to construct and study families of algebra objects built from um, invertible objects or simple currents in the category of modules for the unrolled quantum group, right? So this was exactly the form that the triplet took. So these um, families would correspond to, for example, the higher rank triplets viewed as modules over the higher rank cyclic algebras. And so some of the work in this direction has been done in the paper, Uprolling Unrolled Quantum Groups, which I wrote together with Thomas Kurtzig. Um, another potential direction would be to consider more complicated examples of algebra objects. So this would be things which are not direct sums of invertible objects or not even direct sums of simple objects. And so these algebra objects on the quantum group side would uh, correspond to vertex algebra extensions, which are not simple current extensions. So as a module, they don't decompose as a direct sum of invertible objects. Uh, we could, of course, then try to prove the kazdan lishchik correspondence for more difficult rank one examples. So more difficult uh, things like the singlet algebra and the BP algebra. So this is um, ongoing work. And we could also study in detail the most accessible rank two examples. So these would be things like um, the uh, SL3 triplet, the uh, simple affine vertex algebra of SL3 at level negative three over two, these sorts of things. And so this has been done, um, first steps in this direction, very preliminary steps have been done in the paper 
a Kelsey motion correspondence for affine simple SL3 at level negative three over two, which I wrote with Thomas Kurtzig and David Rideout. And so what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk here is the results of this paper. And so the idea here is that the SL3 triplet is a simple current extension of the SL3 singlet. So its category of modules should be determined by the category of local modules of some commutative algebra object in the category of modules for the singlet. And uh, simple affine SL3 at negative level three over two can be shown to be a simple current extension of the singlet times the Heisenberg vertex algebra. So this would be like the rank two Heisenberg. And so its category of modules should be equivalent to some category of local modules for some commutative algebra object um, in the category of modules for singlet times Heisenberg. And so we can construct um, braided tensor categories. We can begin constructing braided tensor categories associated to the SL3 triplet, the simple affine SL3 at level negative three over two, and the singlet, SL3 singlet, all by considering the unrolled restricted quantum group of SL3 at fourth root of unity. And so for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about this quantum group, its representation theory. And in particular, what I wanna conclude with is a statement about the structure of projective modules in this category. Okay, and so what, we, uh, what I'll be moving towards is a statement about the Louis diagrams for these projective modules. And so I'm just going to uh, introduce this quantum group and then talk about, I'll define Louis diagrams and then I'll get into how do we actually pin down the Louis diagrams for the projective modules. So let Q be the root lattice and P the, root, uh, the weight lattice of SL3 and L a lattice that lies in between these two lattices. Then the uh, unrolled, Sorry, I had a little mistake here. The unrolled restricted quantum group of SL3 at fourth root of unity um, associated to this lattice, it's going to be the C algebra generated by the generators X plus or minus J, HJ and K gamma, where J equals one or two and gamma lies in this lattice L. And so this is just subject to um, these conditions here. And so just as before, this is essentially the uh, uh, katsky kinchini quantum group at fourth root of unity, where we have some, uh, it, it's a quotient of this quantum group. Matt, that relation uh, x plus or minus one, x plus or minus two squared equals blah, blah, blah. That's just the Sarah relation, but it's kind of looks a little different because of the root of unity you choose? Uh, no, actually. So at fourth root of unity, the Sarah relation is trivial. Uh -huh. So for these quantum groups, they have a PVW basis consisting of um, like you'll have X1, X2, and then X3, where X3 is some uh, element corresponding to a non-simple root. Mm -hmm. And so what we actually want to do is in the SO3 case, we quotient X1 squared is zero, X2 squared is zero, and X3 squared is zero. And so this condition comes from this X3 squared is zero. I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so I just presented it this way, so I don't need to introduce these, uh, these extra terms. Okay, and so to each weight, um, and a weight here, I mean something in the dual of the span of H1 and H2, we can associate three distinguished families of modules. So the first is uh, denoted by M lambda, so these are the Verma modules of highest weight lambda. L lambda, the irreducible modules of highest weight lambda. So these are the irreducible quotients of the Verma modules. And then of course, the projective covers of each irreducible module, which we know to exist in the category of weight modules for unknown restricted quantum groups. Okay, so I mentioned uh, just a couple minutes ago that I wanna talk about Louis diagrams. And so I'm going to introduce all the things I need to define Louis diagrams and also the uh, things I need to determine the Louis diagram. So in particular, this is BGG reciprocity for this category. So a filtration or a series is just a family of submodules sub ordered by inclusion where V0 is trivial and Vn is uh, the module V. N is the length of the series and we have 
three distinguished series. So the first is the composition series where successor quotients are irreducible. The second is the standard series where successive quotients are Verma modules. Uh, so in this category, composition series always exist. Standard series, of course, don't always exist, but they do exist for projective modules. So projective modules always have a standard series. And so we'll denote by uh, the L lambda in square brackets, the multiplicity of L lambda in any composition series of V. And if V admits a standard series, we'll denote by V M mu in round brackets, the multiplicity of M mu in the standard series of V. And so BGG reciprocity is the statement that the multiplicity of M mu in the standard series of P lambda is the same as the multiplicity of L lambda in the composition series of M mu. And so this is known to be true in this category and the proof is not too dissimilar for, uh, it's essentially a categorical argument very similar to what you have for uh, BGG category O for finite dimensional simple Lie algebra. And so this will appear when we're constructing the Louis diagram. And so the third distinguished series is the Louis series. And so the Louis series is a series of minimal length whose successive quotients are semi-simple. And so the kind of standard examples are the Sokol series or the radical series. And it turns out that for this category, these series coincide. And so we'll just consider the Sokol series. And so the series is constructed by taking um, the zero component is trivial as always. And then your uh, first uh, submodule is the Sokol. So this is the largest semi-simple submodule. And then you uh, move iteratively through this um, uh, definition here. And so what you should think is uh, Sokol 1 is the Sokol, and then Sokol 2 is something like the largest submodule such that the quotient of that submodule uh, by the Sokol of V is semi-simple and equal to the Sokol of the quotient of V by its Sokol. Okay, if, I, I hope that makes sense. So you're essentially taking the Sokol and then the largest submodule whose quotient is semi-simple and equal to the Sokol of V quotient by its largest semi-simple submodule. So then what is a Lewy diagram? Well, given a Lewy series of V, the associated diagram is the diagram whose horizontal layers consist of the irreducible factors in the successive quotients of the Lewy series. And so on the right-hand side here, we have the bottom is the Sokol, and then above it, uh, so in the bottom layer, you would have the irreducible factors appearing in the Sokol. And then in the line above it, you have the, uh, the next kind of semi-simple quotient appearing in the series. And we want to decorate this diagram with arrows from the jth layer to the j minus one layer, when these factors correspond to some non-split subquotient of the module B, okay? And so I just want to uh, introduce some notation for modules and then I'll get into constructing the Lewy diagrams. So for each weight, we'll associate the scalars lambda j for j equals one, two, and three. And so this is the evaluation of the killing form on uh, lambda plus the whale vector and the root alpha j. Right, so when j equals one and two, these are the simple roots and j equals three is just alpha one plus alpha two. So in particular, the scalar lambda three is lambda one plus lambda two. Now we'll call one of these scalars atypical if it is an uh, odd integer and typical otherwise. And we'll call lambda typical if all of its associated scalars are typical and atypical otherwise. And now the reason this is important is because atypicality of the weight, it determines the dimension of irreducible modules, it determines the structure of the Lewy diagram of verbal modules and the projective covers. So everything kind of falls into um, four families, we'll see. So we have four important families of, uh, or let's say four important cases for the atypicality of the weights. 
The first is when uh, lambda is typical, in which case the verma modules are irreducible. And so uh, irreducible modules with typical weight have dimension eight. And these are also the projective irreducible modules. If lambda is atypical of degree one, and so by degree, I mean how many of these scalars, lambda one to lambda three are atypical. So degree one means one of them is atypical. And in this case, the dimension of the irreducible module is four. If lambda is atypical of degree two with lambda three being atypical, your irreducible module is dimension three. And in this case, with lambda three being typical, your irreducible module has dimension one. And it's not just the dimension of the irreducible modules that are determined by these classes. In fact, the uh, structure of the uh, verma modules and projective modules are determined by this as well. And now in hindsight, I think that um, the reason this is true is because these uh, cases correspond to um, orbits of modules under tensoring with invertible uh, uh, invertible modules. So tensoring something with an invertible module, this shouldn't really change the structure much. It should just be essentially shifting the weight. And so this is why these classes um, have kind of uniform structure. So if we consider the case where lambda is atypical of degree one, right? So this was the case where the irreducible modules have dimension four, um, then what you find is that the circle of this Verma module is going to be dimension four, and this is the irreducible module of highest weight lambda minus alpha j. Here, the superscripts now indicate dimension of modules. And the quotient by the circle, so just by its irreducible submodule, is then L lambda. And so from what I described before, what is the Lewy diagram of this from a module? Well, it's just going to be the diagram where the circle is L lambda minus alpha j. And then the layer above it has L lambda. Um, and you have an arrow going from the top to the bottom because you have a non-split subquotient, which is in this case, just the Verma module itself. Okay. And so we have two remaining cases. Here I'm neglecting the case where lambda is typical because the Verma modules are just irreducible and projective in this case. So the, the remaining two cases are uh, when lambda is atypical of degree two. And so in these cases, you just get a kind of diamond diagram. So for example, if lambda one and lambda two are atypical, so this is the case where lambda three is typical. Your irreducible factors are L lambda, L lambda minus alpha one, L lambda minus alpha two, and L lambda minus two alpha three. So this is just the diagram on the right. And so the Verma modules are all eight dimensional. So these guys are simple enough to kind of determine directly, but we'll see that the projective modules, they get up to dimension 48. And so this becomes, too big to handle um, kind of in a straightforward way by hand. And so we need to exploit some sort of structure, some sort of properties of projective modules to determine what their Lewy diagrams should look like. So to do this, I'll uh, introduce a duality operation on the category. And so V check will denote this uh, this denotes the module obtained by twisting the usual dual module by the automorphism omega. And so omega sends x plus or minus j to x minus or plus j, sends k gamma to k negative gamma, and it sends hj to negative hj. And so twisting the usual dual, this is the same as defining a kind of dual module where instead of defining this dual just with um, the antipode S, you define it with S compose omega. And so it turns out that projective modules are invariant under this, uh, this notion of dual. And so this actually buys us a lot in the dual, in the, uh, for the Lewy diagrams, because you can show that if a module is invariant under this operation, then its Lewy diagram is vertically symmetric. So the, uh, irreducible modules appearing in the top layer of your 
uh, Louis diagram have to be the same as the irreducible modules appearing in your bottom layer, right? The irreducible modules appearing in the second layer from the top has to be the same as the ones appearing in the second layer from the bottom, and so on. So this actually tells us a lot about the structure of their Louis diagrams. And so with this in mind and BGG reciprocity, we're now in a position to begin constructing the Louis diagrams of projective modules. So the first thing you want to do is determine the multiplicities of the irreducible modules in the Verma modules for all choices of lambda and mu. This we already know because we know what the Louis diagrams of the Verma modules are. And so this multiplicity will be zero if and only if this uh, irreducible module is appearing in the Louis diagram. The second thing you want to do is use BGG reciprocity to determine which Verma modules appear in the standard filtration of a given projective module. Well, if we know which Verma modules are appearing in the standard filtration, and we know which irreducible modules are appearing as subquotients of the Verma modules, we then know all of the irreducible subquotients appearing in the Louis diagram of the projective cover. As I mentioned before, you can use self uh, duality to determine the uh, where the irreducible factors, which rows the irreducible factors are appearing in by symmetry of the Louis diagram and some other considerations. And then you can determine a lot of the uh, arrows in the diagram from the arrows appearing in the Verma modules and the dual Verma modules, right? So we know that we have some standard filtration but also being invariant under this duality operation, we know that there's a co-standard filtration as well. And so we can use this to determine a lot of the arrows appearing in the diagram. Okay, and so you won't uh, have all arrows, but so, so with the first four steps, you have a Louis diagram, you know where the irreducibles are and you know some of the arrows, and then you need to determine uh, which arrows that are missing should be there. And the way you do this is by checking for non-split extensions. And so you can do things by saying, well, an arrow from this irreducible factor to this irreducible factor cannot exist by weight considerations, or you can consider some more sophisticated considerations to determine whether or not non-split extensions exist. Okay, and so we have three cases, well, four cases, right? So when lambda is typical, the irreducible projective cover is the Verma module. Uh, sorry, when lambda is typical, the irreducible modules, the Verma modules, and the projective covers all coincide. So these are eight dimensional. Our first case, the first of the three remaining cases, the atypical cases, or when lambda is atypical of degree one. And in this case, you have another kind of diamond, diamond diagram where your irreducibles are four dimensional. And so the projective cover here is 16 dimensional. Here, the red arrows are arrows coming from the uh, standard filtration. And the blue arrows are arrows we've determined using the co-standard filtration. Okay, and so the next case here is going to be when lambda is atypical of degree two with lambda three being atypical. And so these are the projective covers of the three-dimensional irreducibles. So I should have said before, um, this previous case of the 16-dimensional projectives, these are the projective covers of the four-dimensional irreducibles. So we see as the irreducibles get smaller in dimension, their projective covers get larger in dimension. So the projective covers of the three-dimensional irreducibles, these are 24-dimensional and their Louis diagrams are given by this diagram, where again, red arrows are determined by the standard filtration, blue arrows are determined by the co-standard filtration, and green arrows we determine using some kind of, uh, by looking for the non-split extensions. And the final case for lambda being atypical of degree two, with um, lambda three being um, typical, so these are the projective covers of the one-dimensional irreducible modules. And in particular, the projective cover of the unit object takes this form. And so these are 48-dimensional with, um, I think it's uh, 
24 factors, 24 irreducible factors here. And so this isn't quite a complete Louis diagram because we have four, uh, this Louis diagram, this projective module has six um, factors of L lambda. And so figuring out the exact structure of which arrow goes to which, uh, uh, which irreducible factor, L lambda, this is very difficult. So we've uh, kind of solved this problem by not solving it and kind of congregated all of these irreducible factors into one term in the center. So what you should just keep in mind is we don't know exactly like which uh, irreducible term in the second row should be going to which irreducible factor in uh, which L lambda factor or which direct sum of those factors. Okay, so this is the projective cover of say the unit object. This is clearly the most sophisticated one. Okay, and so uh, in this paper, we also did um, a lot more than this. I haven't included this in the talk for time considerations, but we computed say all uh, tensor products of irreducible modules. So this is useful for generating conjectures about what say um, fusion structure should look like on for let's say the singlet or for simple affine SL3 at level negative three over two. And we also go into some detail about trying to uh, construct conjectures for these vertex algebras. Okay, so um, I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, and let's uh, thank Matt for a nice talk. Questions? So um, for the unrolled quantum group for SL2, um, the endomorphism algebras of projectives are well understood, right? They're, I think, they're two dimensional. Well, they're, if they're simple, yes. it's trivial. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're uh, two dimensional, and you have, you know, the identity and some potent endomorphism that's coming from like uh, uh, Cas Casimir. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a description of the endomorphism algebras of the projectives for SL3? Uh, no. So this would be, um, I think, an interesting problem. I think probably you would need to have you might need to get some kind of generators and relations description for the irreducible modules. This might be possible. I, I know this has been done for like quantum SL21. So you could probably do it for unknown quantum SL21. SL3 is a bit harder, um, but yeah, this, this might be possible. I, I would guess that this is somehow coming from all of the, you have to consider the action of all of the Casimirs and it would somehow it would somehow come this way. Thanks.